In Ezekiel chapter 9, he cried also in my ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charged over the city to draw near even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn uh, by his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men and sigh, that sigh and that cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, In my hearing, Go after, go you after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have no p you pity. Stay, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and began at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said to them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. For a few months I want to talk about the mark of God. Beyond what's written in the book of Ezekiel, we know nothing else about this man by the name of Ezekiel. No other Old Testament book has anything to say about him, and no New Testament book has anything to say about him directly. But indirectly, as you and I read the book of Revelation, we see much of the imagery in Revelation has been taken directly from uh, the visions and the images that we read about in the book of Ezekiel itself. His name means God will strengthen or God strengthens. We know that he was a priest uh, there in Israel. Uh, he was the son of Buzah, uh, a priest and from the home of Zadok. With that being said, there's no evidence uh, that Ezekiel ever performed any priestly duty uh, pri in Jerusalem prior uh, to the deportation into Babylonian captivity. Uh, he was taken captive to Babylon uh, with King Jehoiakim, and that was in the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, uh, reign. Uh, most of the captives that were taken into Babylon, they settled among the Chebar River, and that's the same thing that happened to him as well. Ezekiel was a married man. His wife died. He, the Lord told him not to mourn at her death. We know that he owned his own home. Uh, the people of Israel, the elders of Israel would come to his house and they would consult him for advice from time to time. Uh, we also know he began his ministry when he was 30 years of age and he prophesied to Israel for 20 uh, years. We know nothing about the ending of his ministry. Uh, we know he was a contemporary with the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, but yet he never mentions Jeremiah in any of his writings. The book of Ezekiel is full of many of his personal experiences, just to name a few. He shut himself up in his own house, and he bound himself uh, and was smitten dumb. Uh, he was charged to lie on his left side and his right side for a total of 430 days. Uh, we know he also cooked his meals uh, with animal dung. Uh, he shaved his head. He also shaved his beard. He was not permitted to mourn the death of his own wife. He lost his speech. And yet God intended, if you will, uh, for Ezekiel's life to be a sign uh, to the nation of Israel. Now, he's been misunderstood by many, many people through the years. Even many modern-day scholars look at Ezekiel and read that for him and think the man was a little bit left of bubble, a little bit left of the center, that he's a little bit crazy, maybe a little bit uh, insane. But yet these men that read about him and write about him, they did not understand how God had called him and God wanted to use his personal experiences in life to be a sign, a message, an example uh, to the nation of Israel itself. His life and service was was completely under God's appointment and became greatly used of God. Ezekiel was faithful to God when uh, the nation of Israel was unfaithful uh, to the Lord themselves. In fact, he's called the father of Judaism. Uh, when it comes to Ezekiel, because of the things that uh, the influence he exerted uh, upon the nation of Israel, uh, the worship of Israel later on uh, became a higher note than what it ever was before uh, because of Ezekiel's uh, uh, doing. It 
It's also been said that uh, there's some comparison between uh, uh, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos uh, and Ezekiel by the river of Chebar. And the reason being both of them were living in oppression. Both of them were living in isolation. Both of them were misunderstood by people. But both of them received a mighty revelation uh, from the Almighty God that was applicable uh, to the people that they wrote about. Now Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel were three of the Old Testament prophets that were carried uh, into Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah ministered primarily to Judea. Uh, we know that Ezekiel ministered to all the tribes, and Daniel, uh, he was a leader in the court of Nebuchadnezzar itself. We also stated that Ezekiel never wrote about Jeremiah, but he did write about Daniel three times, wrote about him three times uh, in his book. Notice, if you will, also, the message, if you will, of Isaiah centers upon the salvation of the Lord. Uh, the message of Jeremiah uh, centers upon the judgment of the Lord. The message of Daniel uh, centers upon the kingdom of the Lord. But the message of Ezekiel uh, is talking about the glory of the Lord that will return uh, to the nation of Israel one day. But he also has mixed in that a judgment of God that will fall upon that nation as well. Now Ezekiel ministered to all 12 tribes of the nation of Israel and he had a twofold purpose. Number one, he wanted to write and share with the nation of Israel why judgment was coming upon them uh, because of all of the sins uh, which they had committed uh, and God was going to bring judgment upon them. But secondly, to encourage and strengthen their faith by the prophecies of future restoration and the future glory uh, that would come upon that nation. Ezekiel was used more uses more symbols and more allegory uh, in any of the other Old Testament prophets. He also delivered his message by symbolic acts. There were at least 10 such messages delivered and written down in uh, the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel normally can be divided into two parts, but I want to talk this morning briefly about the first part uh, where basically uh, Israel, uh, the sins that were committed under the two last kings of Judah and how judgment came upon them. Now that background in mind I want to share with you, hopefully, the message that I believe God has laid upon my heart. Ezekiel began his ministry by a series of visions. May I remind you that over and over and over in the Bible, God speaks to people, and many of their ministries began with a vision or experience with God. Remember, it was Jacob who met God at Peniel, and his life and ministry changed forever. It was Moses who was tending the flock out in the desert, and he saw a bush on fire, and his life was altered forever. Moses came face to face with communion with God on Mount Sinai, and his ministry was changed forever. Isaiah was in the sanctuary like he'd been over and over and over again. But that one day when the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up and his ministry was changed forever. It was Saul of Tarsus, a religious, zealous man uh, who had plenty of religion and no relationship with God. And yet he thought he did have relationship. But yet it was on that Damascus road that God Almighty appeared to him and his life and ministry was transformed forever. It was the apostle Apostle John, who found himself in exile uh, on the Isle of Patmos, that his ministry began by a series of visions that was able to keep him and hold him and guide him and guard him to the very day that he died as a pastor once again in his old age. I remind you, brothers and sisters, Ezekiel saw a vision. He saw a vision of four cherubim. He saw a vision of God's chariot, and he saw a vision of God's throne room. And Ezekiel went, what's this all about? Why me, a plain old ordinary guy? Why? Why am I been allowed to see these things? This is my opinion. When he was able to be lifted into heaven to see the glory of God, the Shekinah, the brilliance and the love and the peace that take place there in heaven. And then he comes back to this earth and he realizes he's dwelling and living and ministering among an unholy sinful people. When you take the wholeness of God juxtaposed to the evil of this world, he was saying this is what the world looks like, but this is what the world really is. And he knew that judgment was coming upon a nation and coming upon the temple and coming upon the sanctuary and coming upon uh, the people there in the city because of the sins of the nation that they had committed against God. They had robbed God Almighty of his glory and they worshiped idols uh, within his stead. Now God had called the nation of Israel out of a sea of polytheism, the worship of many gods. And he wanted them to be a monotheistic island in the midst of a polytheistic sea. 
God intended for them to be a monotheistic missionary to all the people in the ancient world of that day. He wanted them to reach Egypt and Ethiopia to the south. He wanted them to reach the Hittites and the Assyrians and the Assyrians in the north. He wanted them to touch and to reach the Phoenicians and the Philistines by the sea coast. He wanted them also to reach the Ishmaelites and the Ammonites and the Moabites in the south and in the, de in the, in the desert of that day. He, God even wanted them to reach India under the rule and the reign of Solomon. But yet they were supposed to represent uh, the Almighty God, but they had compromised everything they knew about God. As a result, they become more wicked than the nations they were trying to evangelize. Can you imagine that? Friend, it's okay to put the boat in the water. But when you get water in the boat, you're going down. It's okay to have the church in the world, but you get the world in the church, and we're going to go down, if you will. Instead of being a witness to these heathen nations, Israel began to adapt and to practice the idolatrous practices that they had. The nation of Israel was actually worse off in the sins they committed than the nations to whom they were trying to reach. And as a result, God was about to bring judgment upon them. Judgment always comes in proportion to the light one receives. And the nation of Israel had received tremendous amount of light from the prophetic word of God and from God Almighty himself. One of the greatest sins that Israel did was to defile the sanctuary. Let me say it again. One of the most hideous sins that they did was to defile the sanctuary. These things are elaborated in chapter 8 of Ezekiel and refer to the rites and the images that were borrowed from foreign cults and the foreign nations round about them. When a society is polluted, when a society uh, is polluted and corrupted, then everything in that society is going to be affected. And God brought judgment, fourfold judgment, pestilence, famine, a sword and scattering. What does pestilence mean, Pastor? I'm so glad you asked me. One definition, continuous, contagious, infectious disease. Hmm? Pestilence. We know what famine is. Well, Pastor, we're America. We get our groceries at the grocery store. Hang on, Bubba. We don't know what's going to happen yet. The sword, war. And then... The, the scattering was the fact that they were carried from Israel into Babylonian captivity and the northern tribes were carried into Assyria in Assyrian captivity. Let me remind you, all parts of the land were polluted by idolatry and cultist practices and they worshipped even the sun, not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N, which was a god that came out of Egypt. They also set up jealous images and call, provoked the Lord uh, to, a god, to be a god of jealousy. The sanctuary had been polluted by worshiping all types of reptiles. Can you imagine? A sanctuary had been set aside for the uh, purpose of worshiping God. They were worshiping reptiles and they drew images of reptiles on the wall. And everything was done in secrecy and in the clandestine nature of that particular day and age. They also worshiped Tammuz, which originated in Babylon. He was the god of spring vegetation who died and would revive after the summer heat. They worshiped these things. Idolatry and immorality are inseparable twins through the history of the world. But greater abominations than all of these things were mentioned in Ezekiel 8.15. So deplorable, so hideous, so sickening were the sex crimes that they did that I'm, afra I'm afraid to even mention what they did in mixed company even this morning. But take my word for it, it was terrible. The things that they did were absolutely embarrassing. The nation that was formed to do great things for God had broken the heart of God by sin and shame and debauchery and sexual immorality and perversion and the list goes on and on. No big deal, you say. Friend, it was a big deal to God. No big deal. That's the problem. We think it's no big deal. We have been living in this pluralistic sinful even world so long that even Christians we've got accustomed to the dark. When I went to Africa the first time back in 1981 I spent almost three months there was a cultural shock when I went to Africa. Let me tell you the truth I had a greater culture shock when I came back home. I had been out of the American culture for almost three months. I now listened to the music 
I listen to the TV, I listen to the people in the street, and I go, oh my Lord, what's happened to us? And Americans, we become, Christian Americans, and I'm not saying this to hurt us, I'm saying it to open our eyes, we have become so conditioned to the dark that we have failed to see the exceeding sinfulness of sin, how it robs God of his glory in the sanctuary, it robs God of his glory in the church, it robs God's glory in our own part in life. We become conditioned to the dark in which we're living today. God warned them. Repent if you don't, judgment's coming. God's patience was running out. Judgment can no longer be averted. It's amazing how soon we forget threatening messages that come from God. It's amazing how we forget that God warns us it goes in one ear and it seems to go out another ear. But notice, if you will, judgment upon the nation of Israel was to be thorough. But notice something else. And get this. It was to be selective. Please don't miss that. The judgment was going to be thorough, but it was going to be selective. Execution of judgment was waiting there in the hands of the Chaldeans as they took the last people in uh, to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Notice, if you will, God carries out his judgment in order and with precision. Our text begins, I read this morning, the preparation of judgment on those who committed the abomination in chapter 8. And the crier of verse 1 is God himself, mentioned again in verse 4. But notice, if you will, the charge is issued with a loud voice to show the greatness of God's displeasure. In chapter 8, verse 18, they cried to the Lord with a loud voice. Now it was his hour to cry out his signal for judgment. Those who were in charge of the city, they were angels. They were to be people that watched out over the city, the Bible said. They're called men, they're called men, but they were angels because they had the appearance of a man. The angelical executioners came fully equipped with weapons in their hands, ready to execute judgment upon those in that area. Now it would seem that there were six angels here and one special person. The six angels had weaponry in hand to execute the judgment. But this other person, he has an inkhorn in his hand, an inkhorn. It also says that he was dressed differently. He had on fine linen, which tells me he's a cut above the angels, which tells me he ranks a little higher in authority. It tells me he ranks a little bit higher in special service. That was none other than a pre-incarnate appearance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus and the six angels, they went into the temple and they stood by the brazen altar. Now get this, what happened at the altar? That's where the sins of the people were atoned for on an annual basis. But because of idolatry, there was no way the glory of God had departed there. There was no way they could atone for their sin. They had already filled the tabernacle, they had already filled the sanctuary with detestable idolatry and sinful perversions of sexual kinds. How can their sins be appropriated or propitiated? They can't. So they stand there and the glory of Israel is gone. And that's something you see in the book of Ezekiel, how the glory of God departed because of the sins. Oh, they went through the form. They went through the ritual. They know when to stand. They knew when to sit. They knew when to offer the blood. They knew when to do this. But it was all a show because their heart was not in it. Their heart, when their heart was in the idol worship and the perversion and the, immor and, and the immorality of that day. But oh, they looked good outwardly. They look good in what they did. But if God's spirit is not there, if God's presence is not there, how can God even accept it? So we find that the Lord, the departure was there. God instructed Jesus out of the ink horn in his hand to pass through Jerusalem. And to the men and the women that were crying out to God, that were sighing, that were crying out for the sins and for the people that were sinning, those whose heart was broken, that was on the Lord's side and was crying out against the sins that were being committed. God said, put a mark in their forehead. I don't know about you, but oh God, mark my forehead. I said, oh God, mark my forehead. And the reason being, church, the cries of the ones praying over and crying against the abomination of the people were recognized by God. Thus, he placed a mark in their forehead. The marked ones were penitent. They were faithful at the time of widespread departure of others from the will of the Lord. The mark on the forehead was a type of a ceiling. And while other people were being judged, they were not being judged. There's a powerful similarity between this and Revelation 3, or Revelation 7, 13, and 14. Before judgment came upon the ungodly, God placed a mark 
upon their forehead while they prayed for and they interceded on behalf of the people that were sinning. God help us as a church to be people that pray for folk rather than us being the people that need the prayer. Does that make sense? Now friend, I need all the prayer I can get and you need too. I need the prayer, you need the practice. We understand that. But what I'm saying because of the, 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 the despicable sins of this world, we should not sin by having not prayed for people. We look at Daniel. I, I said a moment ago, Ezekiel never mentioned Jeremiah contemporary in his book, but he mentioned Daniel three times a contemporary. Remember when the decree came out to Daniel, you cannot pray to your God. What did Daniel do? He went right back to his house. He opened up his window and three times a day he prayed to God. He said, I'm not going to be talked about. I don't care what they say about me. I'm not going to let the government shut me. I'm not going to let the devil silence me. I'm going to pray to my God. Amen. And when fire came, thank God he had the asbestos suit. When he went into the den of lions, they did not harm him. Why? I believe there's a mark on his forehead as well, spiritually speaking. We need that mark, church. Before judgment on the ungodly abominations, there's grace and mercy for those who prayed, interceded, and cried out for mercy. God had a remnant in that day, and God will have a remnant in this day as well. Notice, if you will, the judgment, first of all, came to the sanctuary. Mm. The Bible says judgment must always be in the house of God. Privilege brings responsibility. Privilege brings responsibility to every generation. In the sanctuary, God should have been honored. In the sanctuary of the tabernacle, God should have been glorified. In the sanctuary, God should have been exalted and lifted up. A place for His glory to be seen, His mercy to be manifest, His love to be experienced. Notice, if you will, His wholeness was no longer there. Sins could not be atoned for. So now God's justice had to be vindicated. According to Ezekiel 8:11, the elders of the nation were foremost in the apostasy. Divine retribution, divine judgment must begin there. The final order to the destroyers was to defile the temple and to fill the courts with the dead. Can you imagine? The tabernacle was already full of dead men's bones in some respects because of idolatry. But when the judgment came, people literally died in that sanctuary and around that altar. One of the most deplorable things a Jew could deal with was a dead body. And yet here at the very holy place, dead bodies were lying. That's the greatest defilement according to the law of Moses came from a dead body. And the house of the Lord was be defiled by dead bodies because it already defiled it by their idolatry. When a nation turns its back on God, he always sends judgment. I've heard it all my Christian life. If God does not judge America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. Beloved, I believe we're standing on the brink of judgment from God. I believe it. When God sends his judgment, we need to understand that judgment will start at the house of God. The house of God. Which house are you talking about? Presbyterians? Church of Christ? No, I'm talking about Christians. Those of us, I don't care what denomination you're a part of, what flag you fly under, if we name the name of Jesus Christ, the church by and large has compromised the Word of God. Many today have ceased to be the salt to the earth. We've ceased to be the light of the world. The house of the Lord has been defiled today. The house of the Lord has been compromised His Word. We watered down His Word. We made the Word to say what we wanted to say. We failed many times to live the Word, to believe what we, or to practice what we believe, and we failed to heed the message of God. What was the cause of judgment? Let's see it again. God is the God of mercy, but justice and righteous demands that sin be dealt with properly. Notice here, Ezekiel 8, they provoked God to jealousy. Do you and I ever do anything to provoke God to jealousy? They ignored God's presence. They practiced hidden adultery. They became involved in immorality and sensuality. Instead of weeping for the nation's sins, they wept over the worthless idols that they worshiped and they turned their backs on God. They worshiped the creation and they did not worship God, the Creator. At the annual feast of Tammuz, the Syrian name for Adonis, 
or Venus. He was supposed to be the god of fertility and rain. It was thought to die early in the fall when the vegetation withered and the wailing Venus renewed him. They would cry out to Venus, the god, the star, to renew. And when the budding came out, the crops came out the next year. You know what they do? They would go into all type of lascivious, lustful, immoral, sexual orgies to worship the idols. That's what they, I, I'm not going to tell you the things they did was so deplorable. And it goes on even today and around the world. At the festival, women will weep and grieve over the passing of Ishtar. And they do immoral acts to Venus. Instead of weeping for their sins, they wept for their idols. Oh, this is America, preacher. We don't have idols. We even got a show called American Idol. Idols are everywhere in America today. According to research by the Barner Group, at least three out of ten born-again adults say that cohabitation, gay sex, sexual fantasies, breaking the speed limit, watching sexual explicit movies, and are morally acceptable behavior in America today. They're wrong. Amen. You see, I'm not going to be judged by what Hugh Hefner says is legal in Playboy. I'm not going to be judged by what the view says whenever they come on. Come on. I'm not going to be judged by what the politician says right. I'm going to be judged by what this book says we ought to be doing and not doing. Come on. Yeah. Brother, I'm going to tell you, we're in some scary, dangerous times. Amen. And I, I, if you think this message is hard to preach, it is. When God sends judgment... It's extended to all guilty, regardless of the gender, the age, the sex, the social status, or the denomination. The Bible said, the soul that sins, it shall die. The soul that sins, it shall die. The wickedness of the wicked shall be on him. Peter said, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel? When God sends judgment to the house of God, he will separate the wheat from the tares, the godly from the ungodly, and the real from the false. But notice something else. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abomination that was done in the midst thereof. God's judgment is real, it's concise, and in order. But he said, I'm looking for people that will cry out against the sins. I'm looking for people that will weep and wail between the porch and the altar and cry out to me to help see those sinning to get saved. That's who I want to be. That's where I want New Life Assembly of God to be. I want us to be the solution to the problem and not part of the problem. Beloved, as we cry out to God on behalf of our nation, our government, our families, and our society in general, I firmly believe that God Almighty himself will preserve us in the midst of all the conflict and all the turmoil and all the judgment that will come out upon this nation. Say what you will. Believe what you want. I believe America is in, in store for some rocky, rocky road ahead. And I believe the church is going to be through some sifting time. We're going to be seeing things and been shaken in ways we've never been shaken. But I'm here to tell you, if you will stay in the altar of prayer, if you'll stay saturated in this book, and don't be moved by what you see or what you feel or what you think, but be moved by what thus saith the Word of God. And let God honor His Word in your life and in mine as well. Too many in the church have drank the Kool-Aid. Too many in the church today have read the wrong books. They've listened to the wrong preachers. They've listened to the wrong prophet. And they thought they'd been right when in reality they have been wrong. How do we know that, preacher? Because they turn their backs on God. They think everything's right when really it's wrong. And God's wrath will be out. Well, how do you know you're right? If it lines up with this. Amen. You cannot put a square peg in a round hole. We've got to stay in this. Stay in the book. Get in the Word. And let the Word get into us. God has always been in the remnant business.
And if you and I will cry over the sins of America. And here's the hard part, friends. There's sometimes our hearts become hard, do they not? There are times where we just, we just we like to stick our head in the sand and say, I don't anything to do with it. I'm just going to sit here and wait on the Lord to come back. That's not what He's asked us to do. He's asked us to be in this world but not be of this world. He's asked us to pray and seek His face and pray for the ungodly. Pray for everything that we see happening in our land today. Don't cuss the darkness. Be the light. And speak to the light of this world as well. I believe if we'll do that, if, if we will agree with God that sin's wrong, that sin is evil, that sin is deadly, and that we will pray against it and pray for salvation of those committing it, I believe He'll put that mark upon us. Now, friend, let me hear you. He'll put that mark on our heads, and nothing in the world will be able to harm us when the hammer of God's judgment comes down. While the judgment was falling upon those people in Ezekiel's day, there was a remnant of people who cried out to God, and they themselves had their needs met, and protection was upon them. I remind you there was light in Goshen when Israel went into Egypt and judgment was around. I remind you that Noah and his family were in an ark safe and secure when judgment came upon the world. I remind you again this morning uh, that it was Abraham's family and Lot that got out of Gomorrah and Sodom and Gomorrah when the judgment of God fell upon them. And I believe with all my I'm not talking about great tribulation right now, friends. I'm talking about God's judgment that may come upon the nations of the world because I believe God's, God is tired of what's going on. Now, if I'm not hearing right in my heart, then I'm not hearing right. But I'm just telling you what I'm hearing in my spirit. God is about to do some things, and we had better be in line with Him and crying out against the important things that's happening in this world. God has always been in the remnant business. Our God put a mark on my forehead. God put a mark, if you will, up on that of Cain as well. It carry him through safety into a world that's going to hell. The mark on the forehead means that we're crying out to God for the salvation of our nation, crying out for our families, crying out for society in general. And I believe God's mark will give us favor, His protection, His mercy, His grace, and His presence. God placed a mark upon Cain. I don't know what it was. Wherever Cain went, there was safety. The word mark in Hebrew is interpreted as a sign of exception from judgment. That's what Mark means in Hebrew, a sign of an exception, exemption rather, of judgment. God put the mark on me, your mark. The mark of Cain kept him from being physically harmed while he was a stranger and a vagabond. Again, I don't know what kind of a mark it was, but it protected him. The Antichrist will put mark upon his people. It'll be on their forehead and their hands, a mark of ownership. In Revelation, God will put His mark upon His people as well, those that are saved during the Great Tribulation. But for right now, God, put your mark upon me. Let me read it again. And the Lord said, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Make a mark on the foreheads of the people who groan and sigh over all the abominations which are being committed in the midst. Powerful words. We are either part of the problem or we're part of the solution to the problem. 